Welcome, my dear friends. Welcome, the listeners of the Parsha Podcast, the best audience in the entire podcast universe. You are about to be treated something special. Maybe the best and most important Parsha Podcast yet. It's quite likely that you are going to remember where you were when you heard it. And you're going to look back at this podcast years into the future. That's what I think. I know it's a bold and audacious claim. Maybe what I am about to say is so patently obvious to you that it is platitudinal and cliche. Or maybe this is the most earth-shattering, life-changing podcast that you will ever hear. I don't know. You let me know after you listen to it. RabbiWolby at gmail.com. Now, before we begin, I want to share two important notes. I got some correspondence from listeners this week that they really like my podcast, so thank you for that, and they wanted to support my work, and they didn't know how to do that. And to me, that was such a shocking message because I feel like I always share with the audience, I work for Torch, I'm in the Torch Center. Today, it's unseasonably cold in Houston, but that's okay. The Torch Center is still beautiful. And I feel like I always share that with the audience and I say, hey, if you want to support us, go to our website, torchrub.org. There's a link in the description. Click on the nifty podcast icon so that the good people who run the Torch finances know that you want to direct your support to the podcast. I feel like I say that all the time, but I realize, and this is so gratifying to me, that the audience is always growing and there's sometimes new listeners who don't know all the details that the veterans know. So I figure it's worthwhile sharing it again. I work for Torch. I appreciate all the friends and supporters, I call them investors, who support our work. And if you want to do that, the website is torchweb.org. I think it's forward slash support. Whatever it is, there's a link in the description. Thank you for your friendship and thank you for your support. In addition, I am proud to announce that within the next couple of weeks, I will be launching an email newsletter that I'm going to share, please God, once a week with whoever is interested. This newsletter is going to contain Advar Torah and the Parsha, but also it's going to be a very helpful thing for me and maybe interesting for you because I'm going to have a lot of other cool stuff that will be on the email but won't be on the podcast. So for example, podcast outtakes. Last week, the Parsha podcast was running a little bit long and I really wanted to speak about the overlap between Noah and Moses and all that, some interesting Kabbalistic stuff. But I felt like, you know, 45 minutes is long enough, so I didn't add it. But if I had the ability to share this with y'all, whoever's interested, I would record it and I'd send it or I'd send the link via the email and you can listen to it if you want on your own time. Another example, I had some really juicy thoughts on the Parsha after recording last week's episode but I didn't really have a way to share it and I didn't want to send another episode. If I had this ability to share in some other way, I would record it separately and share the links in the email. And that's part of the plan, to share podcast outtakes in the email. But also to make it easier for people, they get it in their email box, links to all the episodes that I've done over the years on a given Parsha, maybe episodes that are related to Themes of the Parsha, so for example, this week's Parsha talks about circumcision all the way into the Parsha. I've done some podcasts on that subject in the past, share those, but also ideas, tidbits, potpourri, things that don't make the podcasts, links to all the episodes from all the other channels, not including the Parsha podcast, maybe share some communication from listeners during the week. It's a new channel. I'm trying to conquer it or trying to at least start it and see what happens. And of course, I'll do it with the promise to improvise and iterate and tinker and experiment and try new things and see if this is something that people enjoy. So if you're interested in joining this newsletter, visit rabbiwalby.com forward slash newsletter. You could also email me rabbiwalby.com. If you've emailed me in the past, if you've made a donation to Torch and you've designated it that you're a podcast listener, I'll make it easier for you. I'll automatically subscribe you to it. But my promise is that I am going to strive to make this newsletter worth your while. I'm not going to waste your time. Try to give you really good stuff. 
So maybe it's worth subscribing. Okay, let's begin this week's Parsha. Parsha's Lech Lecha, a Parsha that is absolutely jam-packed from beginning to end. And we read about Abraham. He's still called Abraham at the beginning of the Parsha. And he is going to be the central character in the next two Parshas. And really, this is the first time that the Torah is going to be following the storyline of a protagonist. You know, Bracious and, and Noah, the first two Parshas, are really not about a specific person. It's more like the stories of of, of Genesis and mankind and, and Adam and Eve in the garden and their sin. But it's really not following the storyline of a given person. And Noah as well. It's really the story about the flood more than the story of Noah. Once we start Parshas Lechelcha, we are going to begin to follow the storyline of Abraham. And that's going to be the next two Parshas. And then, of course, the rest of the Torah is dealing with his descendants, Isaac and, and Jacob, of course, Joseph and the descent to Egypt, and the Exodus. So really, there's a change here that the Torah is going to be focusing on people and the story of the people, and that's going to be dominating the narrative. But there's a very interesting Ramban at the beginning of our parsha. He asks a fundamental question. He says, wait a minute. The Torah doesn't tell us Abraham's backstory. Parsha starts off, God speaks to Abram, tells him, okay, leave your land, leave your homeland, leave the land of your family and travel to a land. And eventually that's Canaan. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you all kinds of good things. I'm going to publicize your name in the world. But there's something critical that's missing. The Torah doesn't tell us why Abraham is being selected. We don't know that Abraham was really righteous. He was a perfect tzaddik. It doesn't tell us why Abraham has been selected by God for this journey, for this odyssey. We don't know Abraham's character. And the Rabban points out that this is against the Torah convention. The convention is that there's a certain if-then formula. If you listen to God, if you follow his ways, if you hearken to his words, well, then God will do good for you. And that's the way the Ramban tells us it apply with David and with Solomon, but the whole Torah. If you follow my ways, if you obey the laws, etc., then things will be good for you. Here, Abraham's told, things will be good for you, go to Israel, but we're not told the necessary prerequisite, the precursors for that kind of blessing, which is that man, in this case Abraham, would need to be righteous. Now, the truth is, of course, the Midrash gives us a lot of details about Abraham's backstory. We open up the Midrash and we read about Abraham's discovery of monotheism. And he has vigorous debates with all the idolaters. And he founds a movement of all the adherents to monotheism. And there is an attempt at assassination. And there is a miraculous salvation. That story, or those stories, seem germane to Abraham's narrative in the Torah, yet it is omitted from Scripture. How come the Torah does not give us Abraham's backstory? It's only in the Midrash, in the Talmud, and various other sources, like the Ram talks about it at length, and it's only vaguely hinted to in Scripture. That's the Ramban's question. And the Ramban gives us a very surprising, I think, counterintuitive answer. Abraham was someone who came against the grain, the entire world, his entire city, his entire homeland, everyone is a pagan. Everyone is an idolater. Everyone's worshiping the sun god, the moon god, and various other foreign gods. And Abraham, he has theological discoveries, and he begins to fight against the idolaters. And says the Ramban, the Torah does not want to get too technical when discussing idolatry. It doesn't want to get into the nitty-gritty of all the argumentations. The Torah wants to avoid it. It doesn't really talk about idolatry on its own. That's not something the Torah wants to focus on. It only hints at the existence or the philosophy of idolatry in the times of, of Enosh. But the fact that the Torah should engage in discourse and in the polemics of Abraham, that's something the Torah wants to avoid. And therefore, it just picks up Abraham's story after his great triumphs over the idolaters, and it just tells us what happened, Abraham's told to go to Israel. A very interesting answer that the Torah does not want us to ruminate upon, to dwell upon the ways 
and the philosophies of the idolaters. There's another answer to this question. This answer, in my opinion, is an amazing answer. It's also a life-altering answer. It's found in the Sfasemis, and he addresses this question. Why does God and, and Scripture tell us God says to Abraham, go, leave, lech lecha, abandon your family, abandon your homeland, abandon your birthplace, and go elsewhere, and go to parts unknown? Why does it tell us that without telling us why Abraham was chosen? And he quotes a teaching from the Zohar. The Zohar says that this message God telling Abraham, Lech Lecha, go for yourself, leave your current situation and go travel to Israel and go discover who you really are and what you could become. That message was not told to Abraham alone. It's told to every person at all times. Every single human over the course of all of humanity has this consistent message from God, Lech Lecha, go. Embark on this journey. Make something of yourself. The fact that Abraham heard the message and Abraham took action, that in itself is the greatest testament of Abraham's greatness. So the Rabban's question is, why does the Torah not reveal to us Abraham's greatness? Says as Fasem as the Torah does indeed reveal to us Abraham's greatness, Namely, his greatness is that he, to the exclusion of every other person, he heard the sound, he heard the voice, he heard the calling that said to him, Lech lecha, leave your current life, leave your current conditions, leave your current environment, and go become great. The praise of Abraham was that he heard God's clarion call. But that call is broadcast to every single human. But only the special ones hear their calling. Only the special ones heed this marching order and accept this mission that the Almighty entrusted with them. And therefore, the fact that Abraham hears this message, that is, in fact, the reason why he was chosen. What a powerful insight. But I think there is very dramatic implications to this idea. Abraham's journey, that's going to take you know, the whole parsha, next parsha. This story, it's not something that we study as a one-off event of antiquity. Rather, each and every one of us, myself, you, everyone you know, at all times, we have this exact same message coming from God, beaming to us. And it's telling us. Maybe it's whispering faintly to us. Lech lecha. Go for it. Make a move. Take the plunge. Heed the call. Go for yourself. Go west, young man. Make a name for yourself. That message was told to Abraham, and it's told to every other person. And I think this insight makes Abraham's odyssey so much more relevant to us. I think you could justly ask the question, you know, why are we spending so much time reading about this ancient figure and his travels and his tribulations and his exploits? Why is his story so important? And of course, there's a lot of good answers to this question. You know, we have this bold claim Abraham is the most consequential and transformative figure in human history. He changed the course of history. He ushered in a new world of monotheism, of superlative kindness, of caring for others. And that influence, the Abrahamic way of life, has really taken over society, has taken over the world. The world today has been heavily influenced by Abraham's ideas. At that time, he was a maverick. He was on his own. He was a loner. But today, the world's been impacted by Abraham. And therefore, it's worthy to study his story. I think that's a legitimate answer to the question. 
Of course, Abraham is the father of the three monotheistic religions, and he's, of course, the biological father of the Jews and the Muslims via Isaac and Ishmael. So it made sense. This is our history. We also have an idea in Jewish philosophy of spiritual epigenetics. Whatever Abraham did is embedded in the characteristics of his descendants. And therefore, reading about Abraham is learning about our spiritual DNA. That's an idea that we've shared in the past. So there's a lot of answers to this question. Why is the story of Abraham so critical? But I think thanks to this novel insight that Abraham is modeling for us what we need to do to hear our calling, what we need to do when we hear our calling, what challenges we're going to face if we want to embark on that journey. That insight makes these partios, these stories, our guide, our marching orders as well. The Ramban of this parsha has a famous maxim. He says the, the ma'ase avot, the actions of the forefathers are the sign, the signal, the guidance for the children. We must model ourselves after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are obligated to aspire to be like them. And here we see this idea, everyone is told what Abraham was told. And we see Abraham following this journey, this mission. And therefore, we're given a window into what it looks like when someone heeds the call, when someone listens to those messages, and when someone actually takes it on. I think there's tremendous earth-shattering implications to this idea. What happens to Abraham? He's given all kinds of blessings. And why is he given those blessings? Again, according to this answer of this Fasemus, why is he given these blessings? He's told that he's going to have lots of children, lots of money, lots of wealth, a great name. He's going to be able to make a name for himself, make a legacy for himself. He's going to be given all the tools and the resources needed to do his job. Implied in this idea is that the blessings that Abraham received are there for anyone who hears and heeds their calling. So this makes this story, this odyssey, something critical to examine and to study. It is the prototype, the archetype, the paradigmatic example of someone hearing their calling. And it will show us the challenges that lay before anyone who wants to hear their calling as well. Abraham's the roadmap. This story is the white paper of how someone can listen to the call of Lech Lecha, make something of yourself, take the latent potential and actualize it. There's an idea I've shared before. I think it's so powerful. I want to share it again. If we are alive, by definition, we could still do what the Almighty wants of us. Because if it was too late, we wouldn't have a shot. And if we wouldn't have a shot, we wouldn't be alive. But in order for us to do our mission, we have to do something. We mustn't remain stagnant. We have to be active. We have to be mobile. And here we're told how to do it. We can follow Abraham's example, lach lecha, go for yourself, undertake this journey. And like Abraham shows us, we have to remain steadfast to that mission until our last dying breath. Fast forward to the end of Neshri's Parsha, we read how Abraham a second time is told lach lecha. But this is not go for yourself, leave your current residence and move to Israel, that's when Abraham is told, Lech Lecha, go sacrifice Isaac. And that's, of course, the binding of Isaac episode. This Lech Lecha is spanning Abraham's entire journey. It's not just this one-off decision, hey, let's start this journey. Of course, the beginning of the journey is most important, of course. But this is continually accompanying him throughout his life. At the age of 75, Abraham's told, Lech Lecha, go to Israel. And he goes. 
At the age of 137, he's told again, Lech Lecha, go and sacrifice Isaac. This is one continuum, one ongoing journey that begins and really doesn't end until Abraham has fulfilled it, which means he's remained steadfast to this mission for his whole life. We're told at the age of 75, he's told Lech Lecha, and at the age of 137, 62 years later, he's still on the mission. Of course, that demands a certain dedication and tenacity to maintain that. And of course, the idea that we have a mission and maybe we're not doing our job, I think it's the one thing that all humans really share. We all have this belief in our own potential. And maybe some profound sadness, dare I say terror, at the fact that we're not actualizing all of our potential. Maybe we're actualizing a little bit or maybe none at all. But there's something comforting here. Do you know who else was not actualizing their potential? Abraham. Until Lech Lecha. This journey is unlocking the greatness trapped within him. My brilliant and indefatigable brother-in-law, I mentioned him a few times in the podcast, his name is Shmuley Botnik. He told me something so fascinating. So first of all, he told me that once he woke up a couple of years ago, four in the morning, and he woke up with this idea. He's just operating on a different level. What's this idea? He says that there is a concept called gematra. We've talked about gematra in the past. Gematra means every Hebrew letter has an associated number. But there's all kinds of different systems of gematria. There are different schemes of gematria. So one of them is you have a letter. So let's say the letter Aleph. Aleph is the first letter and therefore it equals number one. However, how do you spell the word Aleph? You spell the word Aleph with an Aleph and a Lamed and a Fe. That's how you spell Aleph. And therefore, there is an advanced concept in Gematria where you take not just the letter itself, but all the letters that comprise the spelling of that letter, and thus an Aleph is the Aleph plus the Lamed plus the Fe. And that's like an advanced Gematria. And then there's even more advanced gematria, which is taking the same general concept that every letter is spelled out, but it's discounting the letter itself. Meaning, let me just explain this. If this doesn't make any sense, you can send me an email, rabbitwobajima.com. You have the letter Aleph, okay? So it's spelled Aleph, Lamed, Fe. That's how you spell the word Aleph. But that particular word has an Aleph in it meaning the letter Aleph, is part of how you spell the word Aleph. So there's an advanced kind of gematria where you take the hidden letters of a letter. Meaning, if I'm writing the word Aleph, the Aleph itself that makes up part of the word Aleph is going to be ignored because that's the revealed part of the letter. And then there's the hidden part of the letter, which is the Lamed and the Fe. So that's the concept in Gematria. If we talk about the Kabbalistic sources, this is everywhere in the Kabbalistic sources, the the the, the advanced kind of higher level Gematria stuff. Okay, so here's what my brother-in-law says. The word Lech Lecha. So it's spelled with a Lamed and a Chaf. And the word Lamed is spelled Lamed Mem Dalet. And the word Chaf is spelled Chaf and then a Fe, a Fe Sofit, as they say. So if you take the letters that are hidden in the words Lech Lecha, you take the Mem Dalet of the word Lamed, and you take the Fe of the word Chaf, i.e. these are the hidden letters, you get to the number 124. The Mem Dalit is 44 and the Fe is 80. So 80 plus 44 is 124. I know this is confusing. It's probably better to be done on a, on a whiteboard, visualizing it. But just, just bear with me here for a second. So the hidden letters of the words Lech Lecha, each word is 124. So what's 124 
plus 124, i.e., what is the total gematria of the hidden letters of the words Lach Lacha? 248, which is the same gematria as the word Avraham, Abraham. And we know Abraham wasn't always called Abraham. He was called Abram, and he's renamed Abraham. And that's what God says, okay, you have accomplished your potential. So my brother-in-law points out that in the message, embedded in the message of this mission, Lech Lecha, is Abraham's full potential. His essence is trapped in this mission. Embedded in the mission of Lech Lecha is hidden within it, is how you could actualize what you could be. His potential is hidden, is buried within him, and with the words Lech Lecha, he is told how to actualize, how to unearth and unlock and actualize his potential. And really, we're told that this applies to us as well. Each one of us are told lach lacha, and each one of us have to make some sort of move, make some sort of active, positive move towards actualizing our potential. And therefore, it is of the utmost critical importance to carefully study what we are told about Abraham and our forefathers in general. What were the steps that Abraham took on his Lech Lecha journey? Because those principles would apply to us as well in our Lech Lecha journey as well. So what I want to do here is I want to make several suggestions of the nature of of Abraham's journey, of Abraham's odyssey, and use that to create a model of what we must do as well if we want to actualize our potential, if we want to hearken to our message of Lech Lecha. So these are just some observations that I have. There's probably a lot more if we really study the whole story, and you can always send me what you discover, rabbiwajman.com. So first of all, I think it's important to note that the Torah does not tell us what the inputs are of Abraham's journey. What went in to the process of him hearing this message of Lech Lecha? It tells us just the actions. Perhaps we can suggest that the inputs are different for every person. The Torah doesn't want to tell us what Abraham encountered before he heard his message of Lech Lecha. Because what Abraham heard and what we hear and all the things that go into a person taking on this journey, it's completely unique. It's once in history. It's one of a kind and it's going to be tailored by the Almighty for each individual. So what contributed to Abraham hearing his Lech Lecha? That will be Completely different than what it takes for me or for you to hear your message, your lech lecha. And the Torah says, hey, Abraham heard it. You can hear it, but don't ask too much. Don't investigate too much about what contributed to that because this is unique. This is one of a kind. Every one of us is different. And therefore, the nature of our individual mission is going to be completely unique. Okay, that's the first insight. But what is the nature of the Odyssey itself? So first of all, I think, you read the first verse, the first Pasek of our Parsha, and you see Abraham is told he has to sacrifice something. He has to forego something. He has to exchange short-term pain for long-term pleasure there is an element of delayed ratification. What does God tell him? Leave your homeland. Leave your birthplace. Leave the house of your father. This is very difficult. Each one of these departures requires sacrifice. He's being told there's comfort. There's familiarity in the status quo. But in order for you to reach your potential, you're going to have to absorb a little bit of pain. Because your comfort is what you are right now. It's where you are right now. And again, a necessary prerequisite of us fulfilling our Lech Lecha mission 
is activity, is kinetic movement, so to speak. And therefore, necessarily, definitionally, it requires us to have some pain, to be able to try something new, to do something that we weren't hitherto. Abram had some pain, and if we want to follow his footsteps, we have to know that ahead of time that there's going to be some sacrifices we need to make. Okay, that's another takeaway. What else do we see about the story? God tells him, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. To me, this is kind of shocking. Abraham had detractors. Abraham had people who cursed him. How can anyone dislike Abraham? Read a story. He's the kindest, sweetest, most generous, most benevolent person the world has ever seen. Endless goodness, endless giving, endless kindness. And people hate him to the degree that they want to curse him? Maybe this is telling us that there really is no way to please everyone. Anyone who undertakes this mission will necessarily have detractors. If you're embarking on this quest, there will be people who try to suppress you, to stop you, to discourage you, to dissuade you. There's the establishment. There's the powers that be. There's the entrenched interest. And they are going to try to stamp out the scrappy upstart, the one who wants to follow Abraham's path, the one who wants to be a trailblazer. And you have to know that ahead of time. But God is promising us, those who heed the call, I will negate those forces. So we're told, Abraham is told individually, he's going to face internal resistance and he's going to face external resistance. Internally, he's going to have to leave his comfort zone. Externally, he's going to have to face the detractors that exist outside, but he's comforted. God promises to quell all those forces. Now, the Ramban points out, and I think this could be used as another cog in building this model of what it takes to heed the call. The Ramban points out that God does not tell him where to go, to the land that I will show you, to the unknown. So, of course, this shows Abraham's faith that he was able to go even though he didn't know the destination. But the Ramban, I think, makes it a little bit more vivid when he tells us that Abraham was going from place to place, from nation to nation, from kingdom to kingdom, until he arrived at his destination. Maybe what this is telling us is that this process that Abraham, again, is the model for, this process of self-actualization is one that we don't know the destination. We cannot telegraph the steps of this journey. We have to experiment. We have to follow what we think is correct, but we're not uncertain where it's going to bring us to. And we have to be aware that sometimes we're going to face a dead end, face a stumbling block, face obstacles, and there's going to be hiccups along the way. And that should not discourage us. Let's look what happened to Abraham, just in our Parsha. He faces a famine. His wife is kidnapped twice. There's world war, and he has to play a major part in it. He has to face infertility. There is a domestic quagmire. He's asked to marry his maidservant. He's told to undergo a public and dangerous surgery, the circumcision, at the age of 99. And of course, in Eshdi Parsha, the ante is raised. He has to banish Ishmael. He has to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And of course, in in Jewish philosophy, these are described as the tests of Abraham. But what this means is that making a choice to go upon this journey, that's the beginning. Along the way, there are, again, by design, hiccups along the way. There's tests along the way, and we cannot be secure in ourselves as long as we're in the arena. If you are alive, we're told in a comforting way, we could still fix it. We could still fulfill our mission. 
But on the flip side, if we're still alive, if we still are in this arena of constant tests, the truth is that we could also corrupt our path. Even if you are on the right path, you could veer off of it. And therefore, we have to have constant vigilance once we embark on this odyssey in order for us to succeed we're, we're, we need to never lose sight of what we're trying to do. But I think this Parsha is a real call to action. Every one of us, we have this moment, this message of Lech Lecha. We could all reinvent ourselves. We could all discover all the latent potential that we have within us. We can actualize that. We can have this red pill moment, if you will, that we could change course. We could depart from the person we were yesterday We can move. We could change. There's been all the inputs put into us. And that could inspire us to actualize what we could become or what the potential that we have. And here we see the prime example of what that is. Totally life-changing, world history-changing for Abraham. It could certainly definitely be transformative for us. Now, was this the most important podcast you've ever heard? I don't know. You'll have to email me and let me know about that. But I think if we do think about what this story means and how we too can follow it, I think it's not an overclaim to say that this idea could indeed change our lives. But of course, it's up to us if we treat this idea as something nice and theoretical, then I think it's still good because, you know, people change even in invisible ways. But there's definitely material in this story that can literally transform our lives. And hopefully we'll have the courage to do it and to face up to all the challenges along the way and to indeed hear our message of Lach Lecha and harness what the Almighty makes available to us to transform ourselves, to make a legacy for ourselves. We're promised God will quiet those detractors. God will give us all the resources that we need for that journey. But of course, it's tremendously empowering to know that the message that Abraham heard is indeed broadcast to us at all times. Okay, let's talk about the A and Q. So first of all, like last week, I got so many wonderful answers to the question that we posed on Parshas Noach. I want to tell the people who email me, please forgive me if I am tardy in replying. I'm trying to, for the sake of efficiency, do them in bunches. So I plan, please God, to respond to every email. But if I don't do it in a prompt fashion, you'll forgive me. Now, last week I gave the answer to Parshas Bereshis ahead of the question for Parsha Snoach, I think it makes more sense to start with the current week's question, and then when we're done, we'll go to last week's answers. Okay, so here's the A and Q, and everyone knows what this is. Normally, or in other instances, people solicit questions, and they'll provide the answers. Here we flip it around. In the Parsha podcast, we flip it around. We're always innovating. We're flipping around, and the question is going to be posed by me, and I'm going to try to solicit answers from you. And of course, you can always send them to me, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Okay, here's this week's question. So the parsha tells us that Abraham leaves his hometown and goes to the land of Canaan, the land that we today call the land of Israel. What is the first place that Abraham goes to? So we read in chapter 12, verse 6, Abraham travels ad mekom Shechem, until the place of Shechem, ad Elon Moreh, until Elon Moreh. So Elon Moreh and Shechem are in the same region. And the verse concludes, Vehaknani Azbarat and the Canaanites were then in the land. So the question is, why did Abraham go to Shechem first? Of all the places to go to in Israel, maybe go to Jerusalem first. He does eventually go to Jerusalem. But why does he go first to Shechem. So Rashi tells us that he goes to Shechem to pray for the sons of Jacob because they're going to have a very dramatic war 
in the land of Shechem, or in the city of Shechem, when their sister Dina is abducted and assaulted, and we'll read the story in a couple of weeks, they go and make war with Shechem. And that's why Abraham wants to go and pray for the well-being, for the safety of his grandsons. Remember, at this time, Abraham doesn't even have children, doesn't even have a son. Not Isaac, not even Ishmael. But he's already praying for his grandsons and the challenges that they have, which is just an astonishing insight just on the side that the prayer that we do could influence what happens centuries from now. What a powerful insight. Okay, so Abraham goes to Shechem and he prays for his grandsons. A lone more. Why does he go there? Which again is the neighboring part of, of Shechem. It's right outside the city. So it's the same place, really. So Rashi tells us that that is where Mount Gerizim and Mount Aval are. And these are the two mountains that the Jewish people, when they enter the land of Israel under Joshua, they hear the curses, half the nations on one mountain, half the nations on another mountain. The Levites are in the middle and they give the 11 blessings and 11 corresponding maledictions encouraging people to uphold the Torah. And that's what Abraham saw in Elon Moreh. But here's the question. Jacob arrives with his family after 22 years in Haran. So he's really following Abraham's journey again. He escapes from Esau, his brother, and he spends 22 years living with his father-in-law, with Laban. He eventually marries four women. He has 12 sons and a daughter. And he's traveling back to Israel. And along the way, he meets his twin brother, Esau, and they have a standoff. Eventually, he's able to navigate that encounter with no damage. But where is the first place that Jacob goes to after he too travels west and arrives in the land of Canaan? The very first place that he goes to is also the city of Shechem. And like we mentioned, there's a dramatic event that happens there. We'll read about it in Parshat Vayishlach. So Abraham, first place he goes to is Shechem. Jacob, the first place that he goes to is Shechem. Oh, and the entire Jewish people, when they enter the land of Israel after the Exodus, under the leadership of Joshua, the very first day, the very first place they go to is the city of Shechem. And they experience the blessings and the curses on Mount Abel and Mount Gerizim. Seemingly, when you enter the land, the first place you got to go to is the city of Shechem. And the question is, why? If you have an answer to this question, you can email me, rabbiwalbajima.com. Okay, so A&Q from last week. Again, I got wonderful and insightful answers. The question was, why is theft the sin in particular that pushes the fate of humanity over the edge? And I got, of course, amazing answers. Some talked about how theft is so utterly demoralizing, it stagnates society, it grinds productivity to a halt, and on a spiritual level, it demonstrates a lack of faith. True faith is when you recognize that the Almighty oversees everything, and when you steal, you're trying to, or you're demonstrating, you're exhibiting the fact, or the ultimate, anti-faith activity. One of the respondents quoted the Midrash that says that the theft of the generation that preceded the flood was a deliberate kind of theft where they would steal less than a pruta. A pruta is the minimum denomination that a human court can adjudicate. So they try to kind of skirt the rules. They try to find a legal loophole, say, hey, I'm stealing less than a pruta, and therefore you can't judge me. It's almost like the, the you know, the, the, the person who stole a, a penny from a billion bank accounts. None of them could really press charges. And therefore, it's kind of a way to like avoid the consequences of human court, of human jurisprudence. And consequently, if a human court won adjudicate, that necessitated that they were judged by the heavenly court. So we got such amazing answers from the best audience in the world. I want to suggest another answer and you let me know if you like it. So in... Chapter 6 of the book of Genesis, it talks about what the situation of the generation that preceded the flood was. And it tells us that the world became corrupt. Rashi says, idolatry, adultery, promiscuity. 
Vatimale Haaretz Hamas. The land was filled with lawlessness. That's verse 11. Verse 13. God says to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the land has been filled with theft, with robbery. What I want to suggest is like this. Yes, there was idolatry. Yes, there was promiscuity. But that was not everyone everywhere. But the land was filled with robbery, with theft, meaning that every single person was a thief. Maybe we could suggest that when you're going to judge the world, when the Almighty is going to judge the world, there's two different levels. There's the severity of the sin, one sin versus another, in a vacuum, in isolation. And then there's the question of the preponderance of sin. How prevalent is this particular sin? Maybe we can suggest that, yes, the severity of the sin idolatry and adultery and other forms of promiscuity are much worse sins than theft. But there was something that was so corrosive due to the fact that robbery had become completely ubiquitous. And to substantiate this idea, there is an incredible midrash in Parshas Noach. It quotes a verse in the book of Malachi. Listen to what this midrash says. The verse says, This is talking about the Messianic era. And the gift, the sacrifices of Judah and Jerusalem will be so pleasant to God like the days of yore and like the previous years. So what is it referring to? In the times of Messiah, things are going to be so great, so holy, so sublime, it's going to be as pleasing to God as the olden days and the early years. What are these olden days and early years that were so pleasing that's going to be mimicked or relived in the Messianic era? Says the Midrash. Ki olam, like the days of yore, like the days of Noah. Ukeshanim kadmonios, and like the early years, like the days of Hevel, of Cain and Abel. Why? Why are those eras, the days of Noah and the days of Abel, why are they the apex of holiness? Because at that time, when Abel brought a sacrifice, and when Noah brought a sacrifice after the flood, there was not a single scintilla of idolatry in the world. Of course, in the times of Abel, idolatry was not yet invented. And in the times of Noah, all the idolaters were dead. And therefore, the apex of holiness that's going to be experienced in the Messianic era is a replica of the times of Noah and times of Abel. This is kind of an astonishing thing. Because compared to Moses, Noah was nothing. Compared to Abraham, Noah was nothing. The offerings done by Abel and by Noah, how could that outshine the times of the tabernacle and times of the temple and Moses and all the great heroes that we've had? First temple, second temple. The answer is that yes, of course, Moses was much greater. The righteousness of Abraham, much greater than Noah and Abel. But what is so special about Noah and Abel is that they exist in a world that was completely free of any negating forces. There's some power when the only force is a force of goodness. And I want to say on the flip side, when you have the exact opposite, where there is on a certain dimension with a certain activity, when there is absolute ubiquity of a certain negative behavior, even though in isolation, just one sin versus another sin, the severity of idolatry is worse than that of robbery. But the situation the world found itself in was such that robbery had conquered all 
and idolatry and promiscuity maybe did not. That's my suggestion. That's my speculation. If you don't like it, you can email me. If you do like it, you can also email me, rabbiwajima.com. I thank you again for your friendship and for your attention and for being the best audience in the entire world. Again, this is Rabbi Yaakov Volbe coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. If you want to support us, if you want to partner with us in these podcasts that are disseminated all over the world, go to our website, torchweb.org. There's a link in the description of this podcast and every other podcast. Make a donation and come aboard the train of the supporters and the friends and the partners and the investors of the Parsha Podcast and of the great work of our organization, Torch. Thank you for listening. Have a great Shabbos. I look forward to speaking to you all. Please, God, with the help of the Almighty, next week.